come face to face with the fearsome and majestic creatures that rule the animal kingdom. Join us for an unforgettable excursion on safari. They were admittedly a most unlikely family of animals. They became very much part of my life. Daphne Sheldrick lives in the Nairobi National Park in Kenya. Her husband David was one of Kenya's most dedicated wardens. His entire life had been spent caring for wild animals. He died ten years ago, shortly after they were transferred from Savo. Today, Daphne is still making her contribution to that cause. She has a remarkable way with animals, a unique ability to communicate trust and to instill confidence in them. Although her little house in the Nairobi National Park is surrounded by the wild animals which have always been so much part of her life, her heart will always really be in Savo, where she spent her entire married life, raised two daughters and another family too. A most unusual family. This is Daphne's story of her life in Savo as it was 20 years ago. This wild and exciting stretch of Africa was our home for 28 years. David was Tsavo's first warden. Its creation and protection were his life's work. David's field force rangers are quite at ease in this environment. When one understands how to move in the bush, it's not difficult to steal up on wild animals, particularly short-sighted ones. Sadly, poachers are as adept at this as the rangers. It's a never-ending game of cat and mouse between rangers and poachers. I'll never understand how anyone can bring themselves to kill an elephant for its tusks. But they do. They use poisoned arrows, guns, traps, and even fire. The rangers are expert at following the tracks of the poachers. David seems to spend most of his life in the air searching for signs below, always in touch by radio with his ground patrols. It's no mean task to patrol and protect Savo's thousands of square miles of arid bushland. More often than not, when poachers are apprehended, they have ivory. Ivory destined for other worlds. If there wasn't such a craving for ivory, the demand would soon dry up. The killing would stop. How many people, I wonder, know the consequences of their desire to possess a piece of ivory? In addition to the poaching, the animals must face the periodic droughts which hit Savo. It's no place for the sick or weak. And the lions must feed too. Like elephants, rhinos are also short-sighted. They too are hunted for their horns. Some misguided people believe that the powdered horn has medicinal powers. This relentless persecution has made rhinos nervous and aggressive. When confronted with a baby standing beside its dead mother, we've no alternative but to try and save it. However, each time the rangers bring me another little orphan, I have mixed feelings, for being a foster mother to an animal, whilst rewarding, has a high price. It becomes an individual, demanding attention and requiring a sincere emotional involvement with much hard work in the months ahead. How old is Finally, it must be persuaded to break its ties with us 
and rejoin its own kind. A baby rhino in the wild gets enough exercise just by following its mother. Food for thought when one is suddenly that mother. When David and my daughter Angela are here, thankfully they take care of the exercising. We called him Push Me. All ivory and rhino horn confiscated from poachers is sold on the open market. And there's always a demand for it. The ranger who saved Push Me can feel he's putting on weight. Over the years, we've never been without orphans. Right now, there's Eleanor and Bukanesi and Raru. Then there's Punda, the zebra. On the day he was born, he followed a zebra-striped minibus instead of his mother. Sobo is a rather sad little elephant. She refused to leave her dying mother until, just by chance, David saw her from the air. He managed to save her just in time. She's never been as relaxed as the other elephants. Stroppy came to us when she was two. She put up a good fight, but she's quite at home now. The orphans drink from an underground pipe, well covered in rocks to prevent the elephants from pulling it up. The others must wait until the elephants finish. Eleanor is 16 now. She's been with us since she was two years old. She's the leader of the group. As long as they are well behaved, Eleanor always accepts any new orphan as if it was her own. Punda has always presented a special problem for me. Zebra stallion behavior requires other stallions with which to rush about, bite and kick. When they become adult, they then fight to abduct females to form their own herds. In the absence of other zebra, Punda concentrates mainly on Raru, the elephant. Punda's biting on Raru's flank gets no reactions. Elephant skin is much too tough, even for a zebra. Punda's careful of Eleanor. She doesn't tolerate his behavior. Biting a zebra's neck is not normal behavior for an elephant. Eleanor abides by elephant rules. So, as the self-appointed matriarch, she'll not leave until all the others have finished drinking. Stroppy's always accepted that her turn is last. Although Eleanor largely determines where the group goes during the day, Ali, or someone, always goes along to keep an eye on them and help when necessary. Punda and Stroppy have had a special relationship from the day they met. Stroppy, for the first few days after she was brought in, was more dead than alive. Then Punda arrived and was put in her stable. Stroppy only managed a feeble snort of protest but from that day on, she began to get stronger. Punda may sometimes be a nuisance to Stroppy, but he never challenges or bites her like he does Raru the elephant. It's as if Punda regards Stroppy as a member of his herd and Raru as another stallion. All the others wait for Stroppy.
Ranu and Bukanese came from different herds from areas far apart. Each suffered a traumatic experience and survived. From now on, just like all young bulls from a herd, they'll be friends for life. That's the moment Eleanor has been waiting for. I have another group of orphans led by Bunty, an impala. I raised her in the garden from the day she was born, and she still likes the safety it gives. Punda also used the garden in his nursery days. Angela chases Punda out of the garden to give Bunty peace and quiet. She's pregnant once again. I've been present at the birth of every one of Bunty's young. She always seeks me out when the moment is near. Impala usually give birth away from the herd, often in the company of another female. She's totally relaxed because I'm here. She knows I'll protect her at this most vulnerable moment. This is her sixth baby. Clever, sir. It looks like it's another son for Bunty. Well done. Newborn antelope must get to their feet quickly. Running is their only defense. I decided to call him Biscuit. His upbringing will be handled by Bunty. There'll be no reason for me to interfere. After today, I'll not touch him again, so he can grow up unhindered by any attachment to me. Every time Bunty gives birth, her sons from previous times appear. Possibly they find her by scent carried on the wind, or by some telepathic instinct that they possess. Whatever it is, I've come to know them as highly complex and evolved beings, not just prey for predators. Auntie would like to get her baby back to the safety of the garden. When they next meet up at the house, my other antelope immediately notice the new baby. Jimmy is a lesser kudu. Bunty gets on well with him. Bunty isn't nervous of Jimmy because he's so quiet and gentle. Sirua is an eland. She's rather large with formidable horns. Bunty's not quite so sure about her. Bunty's 
After a brief inspection of the new arrival, Surua loses interest. Jimmy is fascinated. How different they all are. Although Bunty spends the nights with the wild impala, after seven years, she still seeks my company by day. I often wonder about this bond which ties her to me quite voluntarily. Maybe it's like that with all impala mothers and daughters. All my antelope come and go between the garden and the bushland surrounding it. I never know how many will return, for as they get older, they spend more time away. Because they don't yet have the protection of a wild herd, the garden is the safest place for them to rest. This kitten bouncer will one day be part of a herd of males only. Hello, Jimmy. In the late afternoon, they become restless. It's the time to feed, to head off into the other world below the garden. They'd like us to go too. Whenever possible, David and I do follow along, for it's an enlightening and wonderful experience. To be totally trusted and to be with them in their world is to see another side to these wild creatures. David told me something about leopards today. Dead leopards. These men have walked 40 days from their own country. They say there are no leopards left there, but they hear there are in Savo. Do they really expect rain in Savo? They came armed with spring traps. When the leopard puts its foot into the trap, it slams shut and holds. Wire snares for catching antelope to bait the spring traps. Any antelope will do. A leopard's claws become brooches. This man will go to jail. What's left of the leopards become coats. They'll never look as good as they did on the leopard. My animals have a hard enough time surviving just the natural hazards. As they get older, I see new behavior patterns emerging. Stroppy's sudden high spirits trigger off the stallion challenge from Punda, which he usually reserves for Raru. Stroppy doesn't respond to Punda at all. Eleanor is watching events very carefully. In the wild, many an elephant has been mortally wounded by an unprovoked attack by a rhino from the side. So it's not surprising Eleanor is uneasy.
Stroppy is behaving more like a true rhino now. With the larger animals, it takes years for their behavior patterns to emerge, but this is a beginning. Stroppy in time will need to face other rhino using the same tactics she's using on Raru. Ponda still sees Raru as just another stallion to be kicked or bitten. Stroppy is still a member of his herd to be protected and looked after. But this touching friendship could eventually make it difficult for them both to identify with their own kind. Each day, the orphans go a little further away from the headquarters in search of their wild counterparts. The elephants are making good progress. Ponda and Stroppy are not doing so well. I cannot rush the integration of my hand-raised animals into a wild community. Knowledge vital to their survival is instinctive, but has to be developed fully by exposure to a wild situation. Below the house, the wild impala ram keeps his harem bunched together, forever on the lookout for other males. Bunty refuses to be confined. She still prefers my company during the day. Nevertheless, this ram is the father of some of Bunty's offspring. Surawa the eland is unconcerned by the antics of the impala. Jimmy the kudu is very interested. That's his nature. The ram shows indifference to Jimmy's advances. He doesn't care about Surua or even Biscuit, for they pose no threat to his position. Bouncer, Bunty's firstborn, could one day. Just his presence irritates the ram. Bouncer, though, has learned when to retreat. The ram's herd is restless so he's forced to change his attention back in the direction of his females or risk another male making off with them. Biscuit, in a few years, might even be the one to take over the herd. The ram gave up long ago trying to control Bunty. And Biscuit is still too young anyway to be on his own, so he's allowed to stay with Bunty. Surua gave no indication she was restless. One day, she just left. Happiness, accomplishment and sorrow fill my mind at such times. My days begin at sunrise. I have to smile when people ask me what I do all day long. My life seems to be an endless round of bottles, large and small going on every three or four hours throughout the day for months on end. Come on, you two. Grab There's always someone waiting to be fed, not just plain milk. Every animal needs a different formula. The feeding is only part of it. Exercising them, washing them, and cleaning up after them become everyday chores. Four ostrich chicks. They were found on the road by tourists. Probably one of the parents was still nearby. Anyway, they're here now. The warthog's mother was killed by a lion. Push me still on the bottle. The warthogs devastate my lawn. That's David back for lunch. Every time a very young elephant is brought in, my heart sinks. 
So far, a formula to simulate elephant's milk has not been found. I've tried so many times before. Now, I know I must try once again. With Aisha, I really thought I'd overcome the problem. But I lost her after six months. It's good to get away and see the great open spaces. So whenever David suggests a safari out in the park, I'm delighted. David is a perfectionist in all he does. No one relaxes until the camp is set up and everything is in its correct place. In Savo, even the best laid plans have a habit of going wrong. The wind heralds rain. David is pleased for the park needs it. The elephants get very excited at this time. I know David hopes they'll charge. He thinks it's fun. Happily, most elephants are well behaved. David's not so amused when the rivers flood and no one can get home. Worse still is when the floods destroy his roads. Living in Savo, one needs to have a sense of humor. Are you hungry this morning? No. Yeah. Okay, no. My mother taught me how to cook over a campfire. If you can cook in the bush, you can cook anywhere, she used to say. I don't think Angela wants to cook at all. She refers to cooking as woman's work. In fact, I know she would rather be with the rangers or her father. I often wonder what direction her life will take. Yeah. Should I take the cards off now? Once breakfast is ready, she perks up all of a sudden.
Very hot. Yes, hold it for you. Sarah. Oh. It's a sight like this that is the reward for all our endeavors. The animals. They are the essence and the purpose of our lives. The very reason why Tsavo exists as a national park. I love the rhinos. It's only through man's relentless persecution that they've become bad-tempered and vindictive. Handicapped by poor eyesight, half the time they don't even seem to know what they're charging. Rhinos will not accept intruders into their territory. They'll fight to the death if neither gives ground. This baby's only a month old. Growing up in the area and protected by his mother, he won't have any problem being accepted by the others. We thought it time for Pushmi to be introduced to the big orphans. We decided to begin with the elephants as they are so gentle. It's apparent that Pushmi does not intend to be intimidated by the elephants. But I worry about introducing him to Stroppy, knowing the usual reception rhinos give strangers. Next, it's the buffalo's turn to meet the large orphans. The introduction to the large orphans is often a rather alarming experience for new members of the group. However, it's very important for them to accompany the older ones into the surrounding bushland as soon as possible. One day it'll be their home, but it takes years for them to get to know the area, so I have to take the risk of possible injury and get them on their way. Eleanor has seen many new orphans join her group over the years. That's that for today. Hey, Pundambaya. Push me and the buffalo are encouraged to spend a little more time each day with the elephants. The moment has arrived to introduce Stroppy to Push me. Flies drive rhinos to the mud wallow. This is a good moment for the two of them to meet. To my intense surprise and relief, Stroppy accepts Pushmi. It's poor Punda who's left out in the cold. Punda has never shown any interest in joining up with companions of his own kind, even when given the chance. Stroppies had enough of Pushmi's irreverent behavior. Bukhanesi, meaning the weak one, needed a bottle when he first arrived ten years ago. He doesn't now, 
but he remembers the good old days and waylays me whenever possible so he can finish up the dregs of anyone's bottle to the last drop. There's nothing left. Have a look. Nothing left. Our mixed herd of orphans, forever growing in numbers, goes further afield each day. Learning about how to behave in the company of their wild counterparts, getting to know the trails and water holes, and where to feed. Eleanor and the others hurry forward as soon as they scent the presence of wild elephants. They have learned to approach slowly. Elephants are short-sighted and easily alarmed by quick movements. Jube and the others stay back. Raru is so confident, he must have met this big bull on previous occasions. Bukhanesi on the right finds a friend of his own size. The human scent on Sobo is incomprehensible. That's Eleanor, with a bull in tow. Suddenly, the elephants become very nervous. What they thought was just a small group of their own kind is turning out to be quite different and very alarming. Jube worries about Pushmi's lack of experience with wild elephants. Pushmi is walking right up to the wild herd Something no wild rhino baby would ever do. Surprisingly, this totally abnormal behavior panics the elephants. <coughs> Eleanor and the others, of course, are unconcerned about Pushmi. Raru seems to be enjoying himself immensely. It's a wild rhino. It can sense Stroppy and Pushmi. Punda is fascinated by Stroppy's antagonist. It's another wild rhino. Stroppy goes on the defensive. Luckily, the wild bull retreats. It's the human scent which sends them off. Pundas following the wild rhino. When the orphans finally regroup, it's Raru who comes back last. Soon, he'll join up with other young bulls of his age, and he'll only meet Eleanor, his matriarch, from time to time. There are many natural hazards which the orphans will have to face when they leave us. Of all of them, Punda is the most vulnerable. Once again, he's limping, wounded by a wild rhino he tried to befriend. As they return each night to their lion-proof stables, I feel a great sense of satisfaction knowing that each individual has moved one step closer to joining up with his own kind. For that is what David and I wish for every one of them. Punda was wounded several times by the wild rhinos. He never learnt to leave them alone. One day he was mortally wounded. It wasn't unexpected, I suppose, 
but that didn't make it any easier. Stroppy has a friend. She looks for him every day. That's him. Now there's a wild cow and a calf on one side of Stroppy and Pushmi, and the wild bull on the other. The bull only feels threatened by the wild cow with the calf. Stroppy and Pushmi are left unharmed. They've been accepted by the wild rhino. At last, they have a place in the area. That's Sirua. No one's seen her since she left a year ago. It's good to know she's all right. At the request of another park, we decided to allow our buffalo herd to be moved to a new area to form the nucleus of a breeding herd. It's a good idea. Jimmy the Kudu now has a fine pair of horns. The warthogs are also grown up and will soon start families of their own. Three out of the four ostriches have reached maturity. Raru still comes back to visit. Then it was decided that David was needed at headquarters in Nairobi. Sadly, we have to leave Tsavo. Eleanor and the other elephants must remain behind. They can join the wild herds if they wish. Although Stroppy and Pushmi have at last been accepted by the wild rhinos, the world demand for rhino horn is still escalating. So we decided to send them to a private ranch where efforts are being made to breed rhino stocks and where they will be safe from poachers. We moved into the house in the Nairobi National Park. Shortly afterwards, David died. Within a few years, Angela had returned from university where she'd studied art, with an emphasis on wildlife. It seemed that overnight, Angela had become a woman. I still visit the elephants in Savo whenever I can. Bukanese is 20 and quite a formidable size. You are big. Eleanor, now 27 years old, still stays with Bukanese. She has, after all, been his mother all his life. Eleanor and I worked together for many years raising our orphans. As she towers over me, I can feel her immense strength, yet I know her to be the most gentle of creatures. Pushmi and Stroppy have grown too. They're still on the ranch, safe and contented. She's very alert. Stroppy could soon give birth. That would certainly be cause for a celebration. When David and I rescued Pushmi and Stroppy, it was out of compassion for an orphaned animal. But today, rhinos face extinction, and every living individual is an invaluable asset in trying to keep the species intact. It's now 12 years since Pushmi arrived on the lawn in Savo. He certainly turned out all right.
halfway across the world, there is a creature that has not forgotten the meaning of family. Here on the plains of Kenya, early morning has brought with it a momentous occasion. After nearly two years in her mother's womb, a calf has been born. With her first tentative steps, she is welcomed into the herd. These bonds will last a lifetime. To be a, a baby elephant must be wonderful. Surrounded by her loving family, 24 hours a day, touched by the family, cuddled, comforted, the tremendous love and compassion exuded by every family member. I think it must be how it ought to be in a perfect world. Perhaps more than any other person, Daphne Sheldrick has a special understanding of baby elephants. For 50 years, she's been surrogate mother to dozens of orphans. She's raised most of them here at her home in Nairobi alongside her human family. Who's here? Hmm? Like a cappuccini, um, Mishak. Yeah. Her encounters with elephants have taught her lasting lessons in compassion. The most recent arrival is three-week-old Ilinguesi. If she's to survive, the nurturing she would have gotten from her wild family will have to be replaced. And if you've had your own children, as I have, and now have grandchildren, it's not difficult to see. They're very family-minded animals. These little elephants are a bit deprived, but they have a human family in place of the elephant one. But it's not quite the same thing. Daphne learned this lesson the hard way, 25 years ago. When I had my first baby, Aisha, um, I didn't have any keepers, there was just me. And I fed her every four hours, like you would a human baby, and put it in her little stable at 10 o'clock at night with uh, one of my dresses hanging in her stable. But that actually wasn't enough. She got to six months, but when I left her for four days because my daughter was getting married, she simply died of a broken heart. Then I learned that they must have a family. Come on, kill it. Elephants mature at much the same rate as humans. Their lives can span 80 years. Like Daphne's grandson, these infants will be dependent upon their human family for many years to come. Their keepers are the key to their survival. Meshach's a hot favorite with all our elephants. He's our most experienced keeper. And uh, these other men are trainees, you know, they get, they're being taught. No pushing, no pushing. <laughs> She's tried to push him out of the way so that the others don't get there. <laughs> when you want to see whether baby elephant's in good condition, you always look at the face. You should not see this bone, you see. This little one is a little bit, uh, tiny bit on the lean side still. The, the, the cheekbone is just visible here. But they're all pretty on condition. You can see this. she's getting fat cheeks too, aren't you? No, come on. The elephants must be very fond of their family, and the, the family must be fond of the elephants. And you, you can tell who's a good keeper and who's not just by the reaction of the elephants. They can read your heart. To look at these infants now, one would never guess the trauma they've so recently been through. This little one was only six weeks old when her mother was shot in southern Kenya. Like the others, she's made a remarkable recovery. The keepers are with the orphans around the clock, even through the night. It is ironic that even an infant like Ilinguesi 
can teach lessons in resiliency. Elephants have certainly taught me how to put the bad things behind, turn the page and get on with living. Understanding the traumas that uh, elephants have to put up with and how they cope with it has, uh, I think, made me a stronger person as well. If elephants dream, might this one be dreaming of the family she once had? Can she know that if she survives, someday she'll have a family in the wild once again? Only 200 miles away from Daphne's orphanage lies Savo National Park. It is here that Ilinguesi's future family awaits her. In a small section of the park sits a compound, phase two of Daphne's orphanage. Here lives a herd of six orphaned elephants, all of whom arrived on Daphne's doorstep years ago as infants. At Savo, they're learning how to be wild elephants. Each day they leave the safety of their compound and follow their keepers into the park. Here they mingle with the wild herds, learning the language of elephants. Their self-appointed matriarch is 10-year-old Malaika. She keeps a close watch over her little family. Back at the compound, the keepers are concerned about their youngest charge. She was orphaned two weeks ago and is still dependent on milk. She's too young to join the others in the bush, and her health is poor. Daphne has flown from Nairobi to bring medicine and see what she can do. He, uh, ele, um, dawie, uh, ulcers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what you in a Melissa Lebolus is Kwanza? A la Funanza. A Despite the efforts of the keepers, the baby is listless and reluctant to eat. She's in shock and grief and a little bit sick. Which is not too bad. You didn't make it, don't you? Daphne knows it will take more than the keepers and food to pull the little one through. She desperately needs the company of other elephants. Malaika, come on, Malaika, quarter, 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 quarter. The next morning, Malaika is asked to leave two members of the herd behind. The youngest females are held back to provide companionship for the little one. Malaika is very agitated having her family split. That's an unnatural thing to do. But she loves and trusts the keepers. And having been an orphan herself, she understands that that little calf is not very well. The older orphans instantly comfort and reassure the newcomer. The change is almost immediate. Just because she's with these other elephants, uh, she's trying to eat much more. There's been a big difference. She's making much more of an effort today than she has previously. So, so the will to live is, is kicking in, which is really great. There's a tremendous lot we humans can learn from elephants. An elephant's relationship with its family continues beyond death. They will visit the bones of a loved one for years afterwards, come to that place, remember. Sometimes they'll come and take a piece of a, a body 
to carry off with them and always remember uh, with tremendous love a family member. Really, in a perfect world, that's how we all ought to be.